Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to Syosset Library's Turn the Page podcast. I am one of your hosts today. My name is Jessica. I am here with my fabulous librarian co-host. Who are you? Hi, I'm Jen. And I am, and I know Jen is too, we are so excited about this guest. Um, This was a book we didn't even, it was like the cherry on the Sunday to see who wrote it. Because as soon as I like looked at the cover and then read the description, I was like, oh, (laughs) yeah, let's do this. And then I was like, and I love the author too. So um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about Mr. Magic? All right. Hi, I'm Kirsten White. I am the author of more than two dozen books for readers of all ages. I have middle grade, NYA, and I've recently been branching into adult novels as well, um, which is always funny to tell people when you're like, I write adult books now. And they're like, what does that mean? I'm like, not that kind. Um, so yeah, so Mr. Magic is a dark supernatural thriller about a woman who, upon the death of her father, learned that she was one of the stars of a children's program in the late 80s and early 90s, but she doesn't remember anything about it. So she joins her fellow castmates, and they go into the desert in southern Utah where it was filmed to try and solve the mystery of what the show was, why it ended, and why they've all been haunted by their memories or lack of memories of it ever since. Well, um, you know, as we said before, both of us absolutely loved this book, and this one just really, like, it floored me, and I thought about it for for so, so long after I finished it. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, um, perhaps writing um, for adults, let's not say adult <laughs> adult books, um, as opposed to writing in the YA space, uh, do you feel like your, um, your strategies or your um, approach or interests or what have you have changed? Um, or do you feel like you're kind of working with the same toolbox, just in a different mode? Yeah, um, you know, honestly, I-, I could talk about this all day. I don't actually feel like there's much difference between YA and adult. There are some pacing differences, some characterization differences. But for me, the biggest difference is the questions that you're asking with the story you're telling. So for YA, I feel like the question is, who can I become? And for adult, the question is, who have I become? Um, and and really, that's it. Um, that for me, at least, because most of my books are about what question am I asking at the core of the book, and is that a question best suited to a young person on the cusp of adulthood with all of their life in front of them, or is that question best suited to someone with a lot of life experience who maybe is questioning how they got where they are and whether they want to stay there. Um, other than that, you know, you have a little bit more leisure in pacing with adult. In YA, it tends to be very breakneck pacing because teenagers are brutally honest and they won't read something just because they feel like they should. Um, And yeah, other than that, I don't know. I I have issues too with people who say like, I don't know, this book felt a little YA because I don't think they always understand what they mean when they say that. To me, it's two things. They either notice that the pacing is very tight, which is not a bad thing in my opinion, or they're saying... I don't know. This book centers and and validates women's feelings first and foremost. So it feels a little teen to me. Like, well, no, we're people too. So <laughs> I have to commend you, first of all. Uh, to, you know, I'm like, I'm 43. Hi. I still feel like I am always coming of age. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm always happy to read these nostalgia books with you know, I mean, with with people who like something that feels very um, fleshed out and it feels very tangible because, you know, I remember it, but it also has somebody who and granted, I know, I know, no, 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 that um, the main character is younger than me. But at the same time, like you kind of get to this point, especially like within like age, you know, age groups like Xennial, Millennial, Young Gen X, where it's like you are kind of all, you know, like. I have a brother who's 10 years younger than me and we talk about Rugrats yeah. and yeah. how weird that show could be. And it feels like it all happened at the same time. I really love that you wrote this book with a character who was not early 20s. No offense, early 20 people. And you should read this book. It's great. Or, you know, like 
you know, like, again, like 60s, 70s, no offense, you should read this book too. But it, it's good to have a good main character who's approaching middle age, who's still trying to figure things out. Because I think we all are. And what better way to do it than um, children's media, which is something that just, it's this haunting, weird thing that just sticks in your mind. You know, you have like the big shows that everybody remembers, like Rugrats. Yeah. yeah. Although you do have those episodes where you're like, did that really happen? Did they really do that? And then there are those shows that like you caught at weird times and you're just like, was I the only person who saw it? And with with people like me and I know Jen as well, who sort of came to the internet um, at a time where, you know, like we were older and the internet was there, you start looking for these things, you start looking mm -hmm. for these connections. Um, can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit just about your main character and about where Mr. Magic specifically came from? Yeah, so so I think you, you really hit on it. Um, within these age groups, you have this weird sort of shared experience. And I think that in a way, Gen Z and younger are are losing that. I feel like the sh shared experience is much more diluted and much more specific because when we were growing up, what was on TV was, that was it, right? Like I'm obsessed with Star Wars because we had out on Laserdisc along with like 10 other videos. So we just watched those over and over and over again. We just didn't have access to sort of the depth and breadth of media, but we also had discoverability in a way that younger generations don't, right? Like the 2 a.m. TNT movie, um, you know, Night of the Lepus. What is that movie? Who has seen that movie? I tried to rent it on Netflix for like three years and then Netflix finally stopped sending out DVDs. Um, but, but you know, when my husband and I were dating, I mentioned this weird movie I saw once at 2 a.m. when I had insomnia. And he's like, oh, my gosh, I've seen that, too. And so I feel like we have these these points of connection that are that are really a lot broader than the younger generations have or are going to have. And and so that experience and that that sort of um, communal viewing, I, I think, informs us in in really fun ways. And it connects us. Right. Like, you know, so many of us realized that that we were attracted to a lot of different types of people when we watched Labyrinth. And when we rewatch as an adult, we're like, oh, this explains so much about my interior landscape. Like that is a messed up movie on so many levels, but it was a children's movie, right? And I think uh, that's one of the fun things about having grown up in the 80s and 90s. It was kind of the wild west in terms of children media. Like it was all over the place. Um, there was the really wholesome stuff like Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. And then there was the really like weird messed up stuff and all the stuff in between, right? And and I also grew up in a very, very religious community, which you know becomes apparent if you've read Mr. Magic. Um, I did grow up in Utah. And, um, and so I have that added la layer of that experience, right? So I share that with other ex-Mormons and Mormons, um, we have this whole catalog of children's songs that we know uh, that no one else knows. Yes. And they're so weird. And when you think about them, you're like, oh my gosh, there's an entire song about how you should never frown. You should only smile. Like that's a really bad message to be giving to kids. And yet we sang that song and we had our little signs that we turn upside down so that we could change the frown to a smile. And like that type of thing and that type of sort of insidious programming that that masquerades as something good right like you want kids to be happy no you also want kids to be able to experience all of their feelings and so so I was kind of drawing on all of that right like the media that messed me up as a kid <laughs> the media that in like it shaped me as a kid and that I loved and then also all of the sort of social programming that we got whether or not you were religious but there is definitely a religious bent that I think is broader than just ex-Mormon it's it's definitely um, an experience that I found a lot of a lot of people that were raised in conservative religions have very, very similar experiences. Um, so all of those things that just become part of you and you don't realize it until you are in your 30s, approaching your 40s. And all of a sudden you realize, like, why do I think that? Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel like I can't access those feelings or I'm not allowed to do certain things like I'm 40? Who cares? I can do whatever I want. And yet. You know, we still have those voices in our head. And I and and yeah, that shared experience and that shared access to these ideas and these stories, I find really, really fascinating. Yeah, I was really interested in that, too, you know, like the way that sort of messaging that we don't even realize that we are absorbing in our childhood, then when we reapproach it as adults, uh, just explains so much, you know, and, you know, 
I am also, I'm turning 40 in like 23 days, not that I'm counting. And like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have found myself just like buying kids toys again, like the ones yeah. that I had, you know, and I said on Twitter one day, like, is anybody else doing this? And then everybody started sending me like the action figures that they have bought or their little pet shops or Polly Pockets or what have you. And like, there's something like about this phase of life that I feel like really makes you want to go back and explore that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm super interested in like the ways in which kind of religious trauma and like childhood abuse trauma sort of like interact and overlap here. Um, Cause there's two things that I kind of see at work. Like one is uh, conditional love masquerading as unconditional love. And the other is like scapegoating, which I feel like is happening a lot to Val. Like, are those things that you can speak at all about, like with regards to the story? Yeah, yeah. So Val was an interesting main character in that um, I I removed her from a lot of, she, she had the trauma, but she has it sort of tangentially, right? She had those poems and she had those lessons in her head, but a lot of them she rejected because she has a sort of defiant personality. I don't have a defiant personality. I was very much a these are the rules. I'm going to follow them. Absolutely. And I'm not just going to follow them like to the line. I'm going to follow them as like wholeheartedly as I can. Right. Um, because that's how you're good. Right. And I want it to be good and I want to be praised for being good. Um, so for me, Jenny, who is a side character who um, was never really allowed to leave this sort of setting in the world of Mr. Magic um, in terms of the community that she was part of. So Val's been raised separate from it since she left when she was eight. Um, so she's had a lot of life experience away from it, whereas Jenny was always kept in that community and kept those teachings and had a very personal connection to them. And um, so Jenny, to me, <laughs> is a very, very personal character because uh, for me, having been raised in um, and I want to condition this, that I try to be respectful of religions and I try to be respectful of beliefs that people hold sacred. I still have a lot of friends and family who are active Mormons um, and I try to respect their decisions and their beliefs. Um, but I also think that that respect needs to go both ways and that my experience and my trauma and the, the damage that it did to me should also be respected and and doesn't um, shouldn't shouldn't feel threatening to them. Right. Uh, and so so for me, when I was in my 30s and I finally felt comfortable enough in my own skin and safe enough in my life and in my world to begin really interrogating these things, um, that's when I came into my own. And that's when I was able to say, you know what, like, this is all just a structure that somebody else has imposed on me. And these beliefs are something that somebody else gave to me and told me they needed to supersede who I am, what I feel, what I want, what I do. I always have to prioritize what a bunch of old white men in suits think that I should feel and be and do over what I actually am. Um, and so so this is definitely a book that I could not have written in my 20s or even in my early 30s. It took years of deconstructing the toxic structure of belief, of um, you know being part of a community that demanded it be the central focus of your life. Um, and so, so that process of going through that, fortunately, my spouse um, and I went on it on the exact same pathway and were able to support each other through it, um, informed this book. And, and so, yeah, I can't really, I can't really separate it from that. And it is interesting because there's an entirely different version of this book that exists. I wrote a version of it. Um, I turned it into my editor, Trisha Narwani, who's brilliant. And she gave me an editorial letter such that I was like, you know, I need to, I need to completely rewrite this book. And it's because initially the book was trying to be about too many things. It was about parenting. It was about childhood. It was about podcasts. It was about media. It was about, you know, this and this and this and this and this. And so I really had to narrow my focus and say, okay, what do I actually want this book to be about? I want it to be about shared experience, shared trauma, um, religious trauma, and basically, yeah, being a child of the 80s and 90s. Um, and so, so yeah, it was definitely a journey in writing it, um, really narrowing in on what is the actual horror at the core of this story? What is the actual threat? And what are the actual emotional stakes? Because sometimes when you're writing, ideas are cool, right? And you can have cool ideas right and left. But if they, for me, if they don't have that emotional core, if I don't have a reason for telling that story, it's not going to work. I think that that's so well said. And I think that that's one of the reasons why the book worked so well. And um, one thing I'm really glad you 
Jenny is my favorite character, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so yeah, I thought that you know, when you were saying that, you know, I think um, Val is a great character and she's very strong and, you know, um, she's obviously the backbone of the book, but I don't think you could have, and I think that this was kind of a, this was like a big thing in the book. You know, you can't have Jenny without Val and vice versa, mm -hmm. you know, and even though they were sort of, um, they are sort of foils for one another, that shared experience is empowering. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to give too much away about that. But you know, it's, um, they're really kind of like they serve. I, I'm, I'm thinking of Avatar The Last Airbender, don't know if you've watched it. <laughs> But you yes. know, like how, like in the first season, like the two fish, the koi, circle each mm -hmm. other um, in the, the 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 northern water temple. High geeks. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like Jenny and Val. They really, really circled each other in that in that way. Their arcs. You couldn't mm -hmm. have one of their arcs without the other. And I, even in the beginning, even when you weren't really sure who Jenny was and what her situation was. I still loved her because I was very intrigued by her. I loved all the characters, but um, she was, she was uh, great. Yeah. Well, thank you. That, that means a lot. I, I, I sometimes think if I were a braver person, Jenny would be the main character. Um, but, but it would be harder to have her as a main character, right? Because I'm, I'm glad that you feel sympathy for her and that you're intrigued by her um, because there's a lot about her that is not sympathetic. Um, and there's a lot about her where when you're on the outside, it's very easy to say, well, why didn't she just stop making those choices? Why didn't she just leave that situation? But when you've been raised in these types of communities um, and it's your whole life and it's everyone around you, it is so hard to disengage from that. And I really wanted to write Jenny with that compassion and with, you know, knowing myself and knowing so many women who are, I was, uh, a caveat, I have an incredible spouse. He's amazing. He is nothing like Jenny's husband. Um, but I know a lot of women who who are in those situations. And um, and so it means a lot when, when people give, Give Jenny, uh, let her be a real person, right? Give her, give her the benefit of the doubt, and that's what's fun about writing these large um, cast books. Is everyone, you know, can find somebody to relate to. There's a way in. Yeah, I think like one thing I have to say about that is um, when I was when I was reading it, I. And I, and maybe you shouldn't be praising me as much for saying how much I like Jenny, because I think if I met Jenny in real life, I might have been very, like, I probably would be like, ah, yes. I'm going to leave because she's coming. Yeah. <laughs> but you in the book, book you're so in the book, I was really interested in yeah. her. And maybe, you know, that's sort of a um, knock on the head to be like, hey, even if you meet a real Jenny, there's other stuff going on there. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's the power of fiction, right? That's the power of literature is we can give interiority and we can give um, this this behind the scenes information to characters that, yeah, if they were people in real life, you might not like them. You wouldn't want to spend time with them. But because you get that insight into them, it creates empathy, which I think is one of the most powerful things that, that books do. Um, I have been asked by people they're like why do you think writers tend to be so liberal and I'm like because you empathize for a living right all you do is imagine what it would be like to be somebody else in incredibly specific detail and if you can do that and not be wildly empathetic and realize that we need to be more caring we need to take care of the people around us we need to acknowledge that you know we don't understand all of the things that we do when we move through the world um then I, I don't think you're going to be a good writer. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. Um, but but yeah, I appreciate that, and I think that's so true with with literature and with fiction. You can write these characters, and you can give them that internal landscape. And particularly, I think with horror, for me, horror is a very very honest genre because horror takes the things that we want to look away from and we don't want to acknowledge and we don't want to experience, and says no, don't look away, look closer and don't stop looking. And and that for me makes horror a really powerful genre and a genre where really exciting things are happening. And, and as much as like it can be terrible and scary and stressful to read, it's also deeply cathartic. And again, I think deeply empathetic.
I would love if you could talk a little bit about the character dynamics, because I think with all of the characters, you really see like um, almost the full array, you know, of how trauma can manifest and how mm -hmm. it not only affects how you move through the world, as you say, but how you relate to others, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's super important, I think, because especially without getting into too many details, like when the story gets really like abstract and psychedelic, you know, like those character dynamics, like keep the story really grounded. So can you oh. talk about yeah, yeah. Shockingly, I have never done hallucinogenics. You won't <laughs> believe that after you read the book, but I have not. Um, yeah, so so with this cast of characters, what I really wanted to lean into is almost every children's program when we were growing up, you had the archetypes, right? Like um, you had the leader, you had the troublemaker, you had, um, you know, you know, these this cast of characters that this is who they are, right? They have one identity and they have one role within this group of friends. Um, and I grew up in a large family. I have four brothers and sisters. Um, my spouse also grew up in an enormous family. He has eight brothers and sisters. And and even within a family dynamic, I think sometimes you tend to fall, fall into those same roles, right? Like my older sister was the smart, ambitious one. I was the good one. Um, my siblings might might uh, disagree with some of this, but uh, but I was. I was the good child. Um, my my next younger sister was the rebellious one. You know, so on and so forth. And then the baby brother was the baby. Um, and and so that that dynamic and that way of defining yourself uh, so deeply with your role in a group. Um, it it can be a positive thing, but it can also be something that sort of haunts you into adulthood, right? Like. What do you do when you were always the good child and the obedient child and you realize like the ways that you essentially stunted yourself in order to fit into that role? And nobody asked you to do it. You just did it because that's who you were and that's who you were supposed to be. Um, and so I loved having the group dynamic of, of this cast from this children's program and seeing the way that the roles that they were given and the roles that they were forced into uh, has affected them going into adulthood. Um, and then it's also fun just, you know, having the big friend dynamic, right? Like you've got, you know, you've got the funny one, you've got the sensitive one, you've got everybody has a role. And then what do they do when they have to confront their roles and why they were that way and, and what being forced to be that way has turned them into. Um, so that was really fun. Initially, the first draft of the book, there was an entire extra cast member, Kat, who um, I cut because she was sort of my exploration of what being a child star would do to somebody. Um, that got folded a little bit into Marcus. Yeah, so, so uh, and that was when the scope of the book was so much broader and I really wanted to, I wanted it to be everything and, and, and no book can be everything, right? And so that's one of the lessons that you learn in revision is sometimes you just have to really narrow and really focus. And so Kat disappeared and part of Kat's personality got folded into Marcus and part of it got folded into Jenny. And that's the other nice thing you learn about revision is no work is ever wasted. Um, you just find other places to use it. You know, I was really interested when you mentioned that thing about, you know, the roles that, you know, you end up playing because that does feature in this book a lot. And something that's super interesting there is that it kind of like presents the, like the ensnaring paradox, you know, of these like communities that are oppressive mm -hmm. you know and that like this is the role that you are meant to play yes. but also like these this is the role that makes you bad and this is the parts of you that need to be quashed you know yeah. and sort of, like having to live in that like catch 22 you know is like really very poignant and very like relatable I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah I have so much Javi Javi um the character Javi is he was the mischief maker, right? So his role on the show was to be the mischief maker, but he was also punished on the show for being the mischief maker. And it is, it is this, this odd balance, right? Um, that it was, it was really fun to explore with all the, the different characters. And I have like, I love these characters <laughs> so much. Um, it was really fun getting to sort of dive into what that would be if, if not only if you weren't just the good child in your family, but you were the good child for broadcast television. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And uh, man, like, that's the other thing, you know, just this whole idea also, and you kind of explore it a bit, like, with people trying to talk about the show and find background for it. Um, I, I love that it's this, um, you know, that how mysterious it is that, hey, there's this show, and it started, of all things on radio, yeah. you know, there, and then kind of ended during that weird period of time in the 90s when children's media was changing a lot mm -hmm. um and i i really liked that feel about it because 
you're so the, the generations now, and I think maybe this is sort of what you were talking about before, you know, it's easy to find these things. It's easy to, um, you know, even like snippets of, of certain things you can find, but mm -hmm. uh, it just makes it more mysterious when it's like, well, here's this really niche, niche subsection. And you know what it reminds me a little bit of? I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm sure you are familiar with like all those Sid and Marty Croft TV shows like HR Puff and stuff. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, I, I'm trying to think of some of the other shows that they, they, they were beloved and they were psychedelic and they were also nightmare fuel. Yes. And I just remember being like, how did this exist? Yeah. They, like, they made, like, this was a production. And like the thing that I found out for some reason, I don't know why this came up around the same time I started reading Mr. Magic is that there's still like subsections of those coming out like there's some weird show i don't know if it's on nickelodeon or what but it's like the main character is like a cousin of hr puff and stuff and i'm like who even knows who that is these days what um yeah. but you know it really like it really felt like that you really yeah. you really got that feeling and you know i try to explain to my kids all the time now because they complain if they have to like take a shower and they're sh they're watching their show on streaming and i'm like pause it yeah yeah. You can rewind it. We had no ability to do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And it's, it's just, it's interesting um, because we do have these memories, right? And we can go online now and we can say, does anybody remember this thing? But what's fascinating is when you say that and they do remember, but they remember it differently than you do. Or if you know the theme song in your heart, you know, the theme song, you've known it since you were five. And then you, one day you're like, I'm going to Google that and you Google that. And it's different. It's not what you've been singing to yourself your entire life. And so I think it's, it's an interesting place to be in as, as particularly as millennials is we can access that, but we didn't have constant access to it. So there's that gap and that gap, the way that things have distorted or shifted or twisted or been half remembered or combined with something else. Like, I, I think that's a really interesting uh, thing, right? Or, you know, when you realize the background on these things that you never knew, like if you look into the Smurfs, like the Smurfs is messed up. It's super messed up. But you know, when you're a kid and you're watching it, you don't know any of that. So it's only when you're re-engaging with these things as an adult that you're like, wait, what was I watching? Like, what, what was that? And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's such a fun aspect of, um, you know, fiction and storytelling and and these sort of uh, communal experiences with other people's storytelling. And so doing this sort of like third party sections in the book. So the book is, um, it's alternating points of view. You have Val's point of view. You have the point of view of the interview or the person conducting the interview for the podcast about the show. And then you also have interstitials that are sort of behind the scenes, like the Wikipedia page for Mr. Magic or a Reddit page for Mr. Magic, um, so on and so forth. And those were really, really fun to sort of build out, showing just how much of an impact this show had on people, even if they can't quite remember it. They know it was there and they know how it made them feel. Yeah, I think uh, the story plays a lot with like um, how nostalgia can be super comforting and like mm -hmm. almost mesmerizing, like in a, you know, hypn hypnotic way, but also kind of dangerous and toxic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, my favorite example of, of that is when we use nostalgia and we make things into things they weren't, right? Um, because things impact you differently when you see them as a kid. They just do. The books you read as a kid are going to have more of a place in your heart than anything you read for the rest of your life, right? But I look at, um, and and this is not a criticism of the movie. I thought the movie was very fun and very good. But the most recent Ghostbusters book, Ghostbusters movie, not the one with Melissa McCarthy, um, but but the one after that where they made Ghostbusters into this like really heartfelt, deep, incredibly emotional family story. And you're like, did you see the original Ghostbusters? It was an extended Saturday Night Live skit. Like there was no heart, there was no deeper meaning. It was, what's the next stupid thing we can do that will be funny? And it was funny. But you know, when you saw that as a kid, it got bigger than it actually was, right? It was deeper than it actually was. It meant more than it actually was because that's what it meant to you. Whereas if you look at it objectively, like it's just, they're really silly movies. Um, but but people got so mad about 
the Melissa McCarthy update. So then they were like, well, no, we need to do one that really captures the spirit of the originals. I'm like, rewatch the originals and tell me those were not just Saturday Night Live skits. Like they were, but but that's the that's the power of nostalgia, right? It's these things that meant so much to you as a child get sort of this oversized importance and weight, right? We give them more more respect and more weight than they deserve uh, because they were formative for us. And so then when people disrespect them or remake them in a way that doesn't feel right to us, um, you know, we get upset because we feel like they are um, stepping on something that's almost achieved a holy status for us, right? And and that I think it can be one of the dangers of nostalgia is that is that we superimpose things onto properties that meant a lot to us that were never there, right? Um, and so so it's just it's just a fascinating it's it's a fascinating tension, particularly in our age group, because we're the ones with spending. Well, some of us have a little bit of spending money. Thanks, boomers. Um, but, you know, it, it, it we're the ones with the money now. And so all of these projects that are coming out that are that are directly made to appeal to our nostalgia and the things that we loved um, to try and capitalize on that. It's just it's a fascinating circle, the storytelling circle that it just kind of goes in these loops, um, trying to tap into what the most people will respond to. And it's it's a it's a fascinating thing to watch as a storyteller. Um, you see it in books, you see it especially in movies and in television, like the reboots, people mad about the reboots, people mad about the people mad about the reboots, um, so on and so forth. It's just a snake eating its tail. But um, but I personally find it really, really fascinating and and just the the power of nostalgia and also the the sort of trap of nostalgia. So I have to ask, what are some of your um, favorite obscure children's media from your age group? And what, um, what you know, you have children, obviously, I have children. What are, what's being consumed now? Because I'm, I'm curious. Uh, in a way, I almost feel like, you know, we try to keep our kids off of the YouTube as much as possible. Um, there's one YouTuber, one or two, we, we allow them to watch a little bit. But other than that, it's like, it's just, it, it gets a little weird and you don't know what they're getting. Uh, so I kind of feel like those are the Mr. Magics now, mm -hmm. of the, you know, mm -hmm. um, but uh, what are some, what are some things like that you have nostalgia soup over, some nostalgia soup that you like? And what are some of the things that, um, you're enjoying in media now that you think might be doing it better? Yeah. I mean, well, we talked about Labyrinth. I I love Labyrinth. I will always love Labyrinth. I can look at it objectively and be like, wow, that's messed up. Um, but it's it, it was just one of those things that that I loved so much. Um, the never ending story, um, Dark Crystal all of which have, um, and The Last Unicorn. And it's fascinating, especially with The Never Ending Story and The Last Unicorn, because those were based on novels. And as an adult, I went and read the novels and I'm like, oh my gosh, these are legitimately brilliant novels. Well, not only that, because I, I have to say, because um, I, I did like deep, deep research into Michael Enda and The Never Ending Story. Man, that book and his life, it's like, it's like Jojo Rabbit, but without like the whimsical Taika Watiti yeah. Hitler best friend. Like that, that man, holy, like it, like the never ending story was really about his experiences being traumatized as a child during World War II and being forced into an army and desert like at 15. It's nuts. Yeah. Um, and the book is brilliant and it's lovely. And he, you know, he hated the movie, but like, <laughs> I loved the movie too, you know, yeah, I think yeah. there's yeah. maybe that's my nostalgia. It's not my personal story. It was his, but man, you, you want to talk about like you, you learn what type of person you are, you know, like, um, man, when I was a kid, I was like, oh, Atreyu, I love you. And then I found out there were Bastion people too. And I'm like, wait, what? You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then to, to more nostalgia while I was researching it, um, you know, I grew up in the age of the original He-Man and the original She-Ra. I did like that reboot, by the way. The She-Ra reboot yes. I thought was brilliantly done. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, voice acting is something I think that carries throughout ages. And I found out that the voice actor for Falcor Gamorg, the, um, what is it, the, the, the narrator? It's Skeletor. It's the same person as Skeletor. <laughs> I am... And I just find that to be the coolest thing. Yeah. 
Bellator is the voice of your childhood. Um, yeah, yeah, and just things like that. Um, loved He Man, loved She Ra, loved Care Bears. I mean, all of the all of the prime eighties cartoons. Um, and then you know, as we were pushing toward Tween, we had Saved by the Bell, which. Well, we could go on for ages about Saved by the Bell. Um, but yeah, all those things um, for me. And then Star Wars, obviously. I think the last movie, the last of the original movies came out when I was born, the day I was born, actually. I watched those all through my childhood. The prequels came out when I was in high school. So that was another that was another really big one for me. Um, but it's funny because, you know, now I look at the things that my kids love and they're so niche because I'm saying all those properties you guys know all those properties you know Punky Brewster you know the one where oh Small Wonder um all those weird shows like you also watch them whereas my kids like for a while um my oldest child was obsessed with this um singer on um YouTube called Ghost and they did these songs that were a narrative sort of um it was almost a murder mystery I don't know but she and her friends were obsessed obsessed but it's this very very specific thing that very few people know about and I think that's what I that for me as a mom that's the big difference that I see is you know we had the big tentpole properties there were only so many options on television so there's a lot of overlap with us whereas with kids now growing up they don't they don't have that to the same extent there are still the big shows like you know stranger things or like those types of things that that they can all kind of connect on but for me i found the things that my kids connect with other kids on is video games so they all play minecraft they all play you know zelda or whatever and whereas when i was growing up video games were very much more a niche thing so i think it's been a shift from everybody watch these tv shows now to everybody plays these games I totally agree. And I think that is maybe the case because like those games, like hanging out in Minecraft is like mm -hmm. that generation's like hanging out in front of the 7-Eleven, you know, like they yeah. don't get to really yeah. do that anymore. So they're hanging yeah. out like in the game together. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. There's, there's definitely a social aspect to it. Um, which is, you know, as a parent, it's sometimes there's the tendency to be like, no, this thing isn't good because it's different than what I grew up with. And you do have to take a step back and be like, well, what is this providing? What is it taking from them? Um, so, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, they're not wandering around the neighborhood, knocking on doors, seeing if anyone has kids to play with. But was that safe? Um, eh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think, and I think that this kind of ties also just into this whole generational thing of Mr. Magic. You know, you can't really bring back the past. Yeah. You know, no matter what you try because this is a theme in Mr. Magic because as we mentioned before Mr. Magic began as a radio show and as it began you know it, it branched into media and there's obviously more to it that I don't want to talk about because you need to read <laughs> this book um but I think there is this constant need of sort of a generation to bring back that their childhood. And, you know, obviously with my parents, it was there, you know, you see a lot of these 50 style diners and I am a sucker for those. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, like, that was a really good period of time for very specific people, yeah. very specific people. There's this, this, you know, like good old days sitting at the soda shop. Well, who was allowed to sit at the soda shop? Mm -hmm. not black people for you know a while and even when you know it was like basically getting beaten up for like wanting those experiences that you know people this people nostalgize and people <laughs> pine for and I think that that's you know um that that's sort of like something that comes around you know you hear people complaining about different things being in children's media and it's like well whatever happened to Ozzy and Harriet well Ozzy and Harriet was a lie like mm -hmm. that was propaganda, you know, I mean, sorry, but you know, they're like, what is it when you watch like um, mystery science theater, my favorite things are those, you know, when they spoof the PSAs, there was a very specific reason why those PSAs existed. And it was to keep people in these roles, yeah. like in Mr. Magic. Yeah. When I think too, like, and this is something that I explore in Mr. Magic is this sort of fetishization of innocence, right? This idea that um, innocence is better than experience, that that um, we need to keep kids 
in a container and in a specific you know, role, and we need to keep them from accessing experiences that are going to change them and help them grow. Um, and, and, you know, particularly in my religion, I found that to be very true. I didn't watch my first rated R movie <laughs> until I was 30 because I wasn't supposed to. I wasn't supposed to access those stories or those ideas or those feelings. So even though I was a mom, I had three kids, like I was still supposed to engage with the world in a PG sort of way. And, and it's, it's this, I don't know, it's, it's a whole, it's a whole thing um, that we don't have time to go into, but, but yeah, that, that idea that we're, that we're commodifying and we're setting boundaries and limits on childhood. And we're saying that growing up is inherently bad. It's, it's inherently corruption. And I, and that's just, that's just not true. Um, and so, so yeah, that was one of the big, that was one of the big things that I tried to explore Mr. Magic. Yeah, I, I guess like, you know, it is, and this is just kind of a question because this is a good time for media like this. I am, a, and I am a very big Stranger Things fan, understanding mm -hmm. what I was just talking about, fetishizing a certain period of time. And they're, they're, the Zephyr brothers do try to acknowledge that. Do, yeah. do they do it as well as they could? Mm, I still love your show, <laughs> Zephyr <laughs> brothers, sorry. Uh, you try, but you know, sometimes you, you can't, you can't get there all the time. But um, I want to know, is there any chance of an adaptation of Mr. Magic? Because I would 10,000% sign up for that immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Hyde, my other um, adult horror novel is currently it paused in development um, with Universal Television and uh, Peacock paused for the writer's strike, which I fully support. Um, and then if I had really amazing, mind-blowingly exciting news about Mr. Magic, I wouldn't be able to talk about it, which would be so frustrating. Um, gosh, wouldn't that be great, though, if I had just the most amazing news that I couldn't tell anyone about? We should maybe uh, turn our frowns upside down. <laughs> if, if, if. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but I do agree. I think that um, I would love to see it adapted for television. I think they could do really, really cool, interesting things for it. For it. Uh, so yeah, fingers crossed. Um, definitely stuff that I can't talk about, but yeah. Thank you so much. This was so cool. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for reading Mr. Magic. Um, it's a book that means a lot to me. It's a very... It's a very personal book while still hopefully being like a really exciting, fun thriller. Um, so it means it means a lot when people connect with it. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you for thank you for writing it. And uh, please come back like, <laughs> whenever you write. Just come back and talk to us about it. Talk to us about Buffy. We'll talk about Buffy forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jen, would you like to sign us off? Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is Jen signing off with my illustrious uh, co-host. That's me, Jess. Bye. And with our illustrious guest, would you like to introduce yourself once more and name drop your book? Yeah, so I'm Kirsten White, Mr. Magic. Um, it's going to be on shelves everywhere in August, so I hope you enjoy it. Read it. You must read it. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.